Hello, you're all very welcome to today's webinar. My name is Emma Lockney and I'm the Communications Manager for the Fulbright Commission in Ireland. As you're likely aware, um, the 2023-2024 Fulbright US Student Competition is now open for applications. We at the Fulbright Commission in Ireland invite passionate US students to apply for study and research scholarships. These awards are open to US citizens or nationals. And we strive to ensure that our programs reflect and value the diversity of Irish and US societies. And equity steps to support this intent include the provision of online interviews for shortlisted candidates and assessment beyond academic aspects. So shortly, our student awards manager, Paula Melvin, will give an overview of um, the award opportunities for US citizens to come to Ireland and tell you how you can apply with more detail. And then we'll have a Q&A with our wonderful panel of uh, alumni uh, and current awardees who are joining us today, um, US students. Um, if you can just go to the next slide, please, Paula. So we, we have with us today, Carmen Jeanette Stepik, a graduate of California State University, Channel Islands. Um, she, while there, she held leadership positions in student organizations related to the medical field and public policy. Carmen also served underrepresented communities and became an advocate for mental health. As a PhD student and Fulbright Fellow at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, she is currently developing an artificial intelligence framework to understand the role of mitochondrial dysfunction in neurodegenerative diseases. Ultimately, she will become a physician scientist to utilize systems medicine in the development of holistic health and the understanding of pathways associated with neurological disorders. S.J. De Matteo is an arts and culture worker with a passion for poetry, drama, queer history and performance theory and is a proud alum of Sarah Lawrence College. They spent two years as the associate director of the award-winning Mint Theatre Company New York. S.J. is currently spending their Fulbright year as a postgraduate researcher at Trinity College Dublin. Their thesis focus on the life and work of Teresa Deeby, one of Ireland's most prolific and routine, routinely overlooked 20th century writers. They've been selected to present original research on the DV, uh, on DV at conferences with the International Association for the Study of Irish Literatures and the Irish Society for Theatre Research. Kate Barnica is a clinical fellow at Harvard Law School's Animal Law and Policy Programme. She graduated from Harvard Law School in 2019, where she, has, where she served as co-president of the Animal Law Society and as an article editor for the Journal of Law and Gender. Before law school, Kate received a Fulbright Award to Ireland, where she earned a Master's of Arts in Sexuality Studies from Dublin City University. She graduated from Rowlands College in 2015 with a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy and a minor in Sexuality, Women's and Gender Studies. So before we hear from our fantastic panel, um, I just want to talk a little bit about Ireland um, and why you might choose to come to Ireland. So of course our alum, Paul will tell you more, and then our alum will tell you more about their experiences to date. Um, but just as an overview, uh, our, our, our general alum between Ireland and the US, there is over 2,500, more than 1,000 of those would be US scholars and students coming to Ireland. And they have told us that they have found Ireland to be friendly, engaging, and a vibrant country, which also has, of course, centuries of interaction with the US. There's a highly educated workforce, competitive educational system, and millennia of culture. So it's a popular choice for Fulbright applicants, particularly in the All Disciplines Award category. But it is worth noting that some of our sponsored field-specific awards are undersubscribed. So Paula will talk to you about which ones are undersubscribed um, in general. And we're also actively seeking candidates for these field specific awards. So um, previous alum, our previous awardees have said um, they chose and enjoyed Ireland because they found it to be very welcoming, safe, culturally rich and diverse, as well as accessible. Higher education in Ireland is provided by nine universities, nine institutes of technology, most of which have now been amalgamated into technological universities, and several colleges of education around the country. There are also a significant number of well-funded research centres and cultural institutions. So most higher education institutions in Ireland are supported by Irish, the Irish government, 
For example, universities and institutes of technology receive more than 90% of their income from the state. Um, and as Ireland is a small country, um, we can support US awardees to come together from all over um, the country at a number of celebrations and ceremonies orientations throughout the year. Obviously, the last two years, we haven't had much opportunity to do that, but now the things have opened up again in Ireland and restrictions have lifted. Um, we'll be having in-person events again, uh, and we really enjoy seeing all of our US awardees um, together. Um, so now I'd like to introduce my colleague Paula Melvin to give an overview of the program and of Ireland. So there's just a few uh, slides there. There's one of SJ actually <laughs> enjoying time in Ireland. So Paula, if you want to um, go on to your slides now, you can. Brilliant. Thanks, William Emma. And um, so the awards kind of follow the same pattern pretty much every year. In early April, possibly the end of March every year, the application period, the competition period open. In October every year, the application period for US students closes. But I strongly urge you not to leave it until October. Now is the correct time to get working on your application. And then in October to December, my colleagues in the Institute of the International of Ed Education in the United States, also known as IE, IE manage Fulbright in the US. So we are the Irish Commission, so we manage kind of a lot of the applications for Irish people going to the US, but the, this application period and this application competition is actually managed by IAE. So my colleagues in the States will be reviewing your applications between October and December 2022, shortlisting it. Then in 2023, when the semi-final from the United States are right on my desk. I work with the host institutions who have sponsored awards to select the, the principal candidates. And for the all discipline candidates or the open study candidates, we conduct interviews virtually. This is part of an equity step that my colleague Emma mentioned earlier. And then in March, April, we have the very happy circumstances where we get to inform IE of who has been selected for selected for an award and we inform IE and then IE can inform the lucky new Fulbrighters. So like I said, now is the perfect time to begin planning your application. So review all the information on our website, fulbright.ie and on IE's website as well. And um, definitely on our website, fulbright.ie, um, visit our coming to Ireland section and look at our supports in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion policies and resources. We have campus ambassadors. So say if you want to go to UCD or UCC or NYG, wherever you want to go, we should have a campus ambassador on that campus here in Ireland. So if you're interested in a particular institution, perhaps you should reach out to that person or campus ambassador. They're all volunteers and they're here to help. They tend to be alumni who've gone to the States and are now back in Ireland and um, choose the award that's right for you. You're all in this student awards webinar. So I assume you're here to do um, independent study or to do part of your PhD or the majority of US students we have come to Ireland in my time with mission have actually been, have actually come here to do masters. You need to plan your proposal and your, your contact your host institution. So definitely figure out where in Ireland you want to go um, we want diversity of host, of host institutions here in Ireland, so the Institute of Technologies, and you don't have to come to Dublin or Cork, so think outside the box. Definitely research what it means to be a Fulbrighter. Fulbright is very much so about the greater good. It's not just about you. It's also about kind of what are you going to do outside the classroom or outside the laboratory, and what kind of cultural aspects are you involved in, and what are you going to bring from the United States to Ireland? And when you return to the United States, what are you going to take with you from Ireland? And how do you plan to keep involved with the program in the future? We have the Ireland United States Alumni Association and the Irish Fulbright Alumni Association as well. And you can also register interest now at fulbrightonline.org um, to get your application started. The application materials you need to prepare, your, bio, your biographical data, all that key information, program information, statement to grant purpose, your affiliation letter. You should get a letter of affiliation from your host institution in Ireland, be that Letterkenny IT or wherever you want to go. 
um, if possible. Sometimes the deadlines don't actually line up. The deadline for that Pacific host institution doesn't exactly line up with the deadline for Fulbright. So that's fine. If it's not possible to get it, it's not possible at all. Personal statement recommendations, you're not able to read your recommendations, um, but you do need to ask people to fill those out for you. Um, transcript, transcripts, art applicants, see website for supplementary requirements. And like I said, register for at usfulbrightonline.org to receive guidelines. Uh, the guidelines tend to change every year. So make sure if you're a repeat applicant, um, you need to check that now. Um, repeat applicants are most definitely welcome. So apply through your US college if you're currently enrolled. So a lot of those institutions in the United States will have what they're called Fulbright Program Advisors. And they will have they may have internal deadlines before the Fulbright IAE October deadline, which may be four to six weeks earlier, depending on the host in, uh, on the college in the United States. So reach out to your school where you're studying and they can help you guide you through the process. And if you are an alumni, they may let you still apply to your alma mater. So it's always worth reaching out. And at large candidates must submit through the Fulbright system by official by the official deadline in October. Now, if you even apply through your host institution, your home college, you must also apply by the deadline in October, um, regardless of if you've been at large or not. And um, I would like on the admin side of things, please be careful to fill in all boxes on that application to make my life easier when processing. So make sure to fill in uh, boxes like grant duration to make my life easier. <laughs> So there's different awards and you have different options to come to Ireland. So study research academic grants, study research creative and performing arts, um, research the Fulbright National Geographic Award and the research Fulbright Schumann Award that are managed by our colleagues in Fulbright in Belgium. And there are Fulbright commissions like Fulbright Ireland all around the world. Um, not all countries have commissions, but a lot of countries around the world have Fulbright and they have posts within embassies around the world. Please note if you're applying to a Schumann Award, for example, you cannot apply for an Irish award, an, an award to come and undertake an all discipline award in UCC, for example, you can only apply to one commission per year. So you cannot apply for one award in Fulbright Ireland and another in Fulbright France or one in Fulbright to, to the Norwegian Commission and another to the German Commission. So think carefully about where you want to go. And um, Further details will actually be announced soon about that Fulbright National Geographic Award that's actually quite a new award. So then the All Disciplines are Open Study Awards. They are research grants. You must secure your own affiliation here in Ireland to so figure out where you want to go and you must secure your own admission at an Irish institution. And when I say an Irish institution, um, there is Northern Ireland. So if you are thinking about going to Belfast or Derry or somewhere in the north or Northern Ireland, um, you're actually applying to the UK Fulbright Commission. Um, these Fulbright study research grants are open to all disciplines, maximum grant of 16,500 euro. And you can also apply to the Thought Master's Programme. You must secure a mission again out of 107 listed institutions, maximum grant of 16,500 euro plus tuition waiver. Finding a host. So think about what, who you want to work with, study with. So universities, institutes of technology, cultural institutions, research institutions. Find, a re, find experts in your field, reach out to Fulbright alumni. A lot of them are listed on fulbright.ie. If you wish to get in touch with someone in particular, we can help you there. Myself or Emma, reach out to us and we can put you in touch. And consider diverse institutions where you can build new Irish US connections. So then sponsored student award, like Emma said, some of our sponsored awards are actually undersubscribed. Now, all Fulbright awards are always incredibly, incredibly competitive, especially Fulbright awards to Ireland. However, um, that said, if you're applying for an all discipline award, naturally, you'll be applying a people against kind of in competition with people who are doing physics and volcanology, you name it. Um, whereas if you're applying for a sponsored award, there will be less people applying. So str think strategically. So if you're interested in going to where I did my undergraduate degree, DCU, there's a Thought Masters uh, award there. You have to secure your own admission to DCU in one of the following, in one of the schools listed on the screen, maximum stipend of 16,500 plus a tuition waiver. Then if you wanna to go to where both Emma and I did our masters, 
in University College Dublin. Uh, DCU and UCD are separate institutions on two sides of Dublin City. Um, again, similarly in UCD, you must secure admission to UCD to one of the following schools, maximum stipend of €16,500 plus a tuition waiver. Or University College Cork Masters in Creative Writing, which is a very popular award. You must secure admission to UCD Masters in Creative Writing. You must provide proof of acceptance required by time of submission to the Fulbright. And again, maximum grant of €16,500 plus a tuition waiver. Then we have two PhD opportunities. So the Peter Real Analog Devices Award, PhD program in University of Limerick. You must secure admission to UL and the Fulbright Award is for 12 months and UL will fund an additional three or four years. And then Carmen will be uh, in a much better position to talk about the RCSI, the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland PhD Scholarship Award. Uh, Carmen and Selena were the two first recipients of this high valued award. Uh, 18,000 euro stipend, relocation costs, et cetera, and student visa weight. And that's for a four year PhD with RCSI and you must secure affiliation with RCSI. I do not have a medical background, but um, you must register with one of the STAR program and they have a very long list of different areas of science that you can apply to a PhD in. So it's very broad in my understanding, but Carmen can correct me later on about this. Then we have the Hugh Lane Gallery Curatorial Award in Dublin City Gallery. You must include initial letter of affiliation in your application and your maximum stipend is €20,000. Uh, a new award we have that is very close to all of our hearts here in the Irish Fulbright Commission is the new Frederick and Anna Douglas Award. We thought it was very important to include Anna Douglas in, in the award's name. So this, this great initiative is founded in cooperation with Frederick Douglas Family Initiatives. It's established with the goal of increasing participation of diverse communities in US Irish exchanges. You can complete a master's in civil rights or related leadership topics at DCU. Proposals for doctoral or non-degree master's level research will also be considered. So it's quite a broad award as well. Maximum stipend is 16,500 plus a tuition waiver. Um, and then another new award we have is to undertake an MA of Science and Public Health in the University of Limerick. And then again, you've 16,500 tuition, uh, so living stipend plus a tuition waiver. And when I say living stipend, that's for your living stipend and your travel expenses. So we don't ask for receipts. You simply book your own travel here and your own travel home. And um, diversity inclusion is another initiative that Emma in particular and a lot of us in the Fulbright family here in Ireland have been part of. So um, we really do, as Emma alluded to earlier, we welcome candidates from underrepresented communities, areas of research, um, I always love when someone has a project that I don't fully understand at the start. It's just wonderful, the breadth and diversity of different kind of research proposals and things that people do. I know experts in every single field pretty much because of the amount of different Fulbrighters we've had become members of the Fulbright family here. And when I say Fulbright family, it really is a Fulbright family. Um, home organizations and HEIs, as in we don't just want people from California and New York and Boston or, do you know what I mean, as in we want North Dakota, Kansas, we want a wide variety of people coming from a wide variety of backgrounds, community colleges and everywhere else in geographic areas, uh, ethnicities. I'm always touched when I meet Irish Americans who are particularly passionate about being Irish American. It is wonderful to see, but we want to see our awardees be truly representative of what America looks like um, and ability and Fulbright is obviously about people, so sh please share who you are. We have there's no loads of um, of different kind of of different um, resources out there, like Fulbright Noir. There's a few of them there listed on the screen. But for more, you can visit Fulbright.ie, the Irish Commission Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion section, and we have a wonderful panel. Uh, our equity steps, as Emma mentioned again, we hold online interviews for shortlisted candidates in the all discipline categories, uh, and then certain awards like the RCSI Sponsored Student Award also conduct their own interviews. Uh, we have a Fulbright Opportunity Fund for candidates who are successful in their application. Um, Fulbright Awards should make the Irish program managers aware of relevant needs. So we do have the Fulbright Opportunity Fund and Mary McCartan Bursary is in memory of the Fulbright Irish alumna and renowned singer, producer, mentor, Mary McCartland. The first series for 5,000 euros annually awarded to two Fulbright Award recipients. So that's some of our equity steps and we're always open to new suggestions. So the next steps, um, like I said, 
review eligibility criteria on fulbright.ie and the IE website as well, register your interest on in IE's website. We uh, go on our YouTube channel and also on IE's website, there's some great videos with alumni and tips about conducting your application, how to collate it, and reach out to your Irish institutions for a letter of affiliation and naturally reach out and talk to people, talk to our alumni, talk to us. Don't be a stranger and hopefully we can point you in the right direction. Also, um, talk to your kind of researchers, your mentors who are experts in your field. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Emma so we can hear from our wonderful alumni about their experiences in Ireland. Gurmagas, thank you. Emma, the classic, I think you're on mute. Apologies. Um, yeah, so that's just, uh, thank you very much, Paula, a uh, brief overview of the award. So now we can hear some stories from our current awardees and alumni, um, two of whom are in Ireland at the moment. Um, and uh, maybe I'll ask um, perhaps each of you to say a few words about your Fulbright project, what it is you, you were or are doing in Ireland on your Fulbright award, um, and, then, and then we'll cover a few questions. So just before that, if anyone attending does have any questions for Paula or for any of us along the way, please do feel free to type them into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, okay, so what about, would uh, SJ, would you be okay to start to say a few words about what you're doing in Ireland at the moment? Sure. Uh, I am a current awardee this year. And as was mentioned briefly in my bio, I am conducting research and helping carry out an advocacy campaign for the Irish author Teresa Devey, whose work was most prominent in the 1930s, but whose career spanned the 20s through the 1950s. Um, yeah, she's one of the most remarkable authors of the 20th century and has been widely erased and forgotten. Um, and I'm here re-examining her work in a 21st century context. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, Carmen, would you tell us what you're doing in Ireland at the moment? Well, I'm doing my PhD at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, and um, my project is on Parkinson's disease. So I'm using both computational and experimental methods to kind of um, try and crack the code. Uh, there's not a lot that's known about Parkinson's as well as other neurodegenerative diseases. So um, that's what my research aims to to figure out more on. Thank you very much. Look forward to hearing more about that. And Kate, thanks for joining. Can you tell us a little bit about what you did in Ireland um, a few years ago? Of course, and apologies for my uh, lateness, everybody, but I uh, was in Ireland from 2015 to 2016, um, and I did the top master's program at Dublin City University, where I did uh, my master's degree in sexuality studies, um, with a particular focus in, in my final dissertation, looking at the uh, coverage in Irish media of sexual assault trials. Oh, very interesting. Um, okay, great. Well, you can see even from the very start that each of our um, student awardees have very um, different uh, subjects that they're, they're exploring while in Ireland. But I suppose one of the key questions I want to ask you to share with everyone is, why you did choose Ireland. So there's many countries that you can choose to go in your Fulbright to. Um, uh, what was it that drew you to Ireland? Who wants to take that one first? Um, so yeah. I have a little bit of experience. I had experience coming to Ireland before I applied and I was actually doing an internship at Trinity College Dublin in physics. And I realized that I really loved Ireland and, and Dublin, but I realized I didn't want to study physics. So instead of applying for a PhD at TCD, I was looking at other programs that I could um, do my PhD at. And it just so happens that um, one of the researchers that I met on my, on my search, basically uh, we really meshed, we hit it off and um, she had a similar background to me. Um, her background is in electrical engineering and um, my background is in physics. So it was kind of like a good fit to, um, to do some research with someone that had a similar transition into biomedical science. Uh, but basically I just really wanted to come back to Ireland and uh, I found a way to do that essentially with the Fulbright. 
Nice. And, and I think you told me before, Carmen, that your initial visit to Ireland had been an exchange with your school, was it? Yeah, it was uh, another, an international internship, essentially, with uh, California students. Excellent. End up changing the course of your career in many ways then. <laughs> um, okay, great. And, and what about you, SJ? Um, I know your topic of research, obviously, has a lot to do with Ireland. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I ended up studying Irish modernism uh, as an undergraduate student, which was unexpected. I went and studying American lit. Um, and the short version is it kind of came out of a period of um, blind rage and indignation. I was, as an undergraduate, taking a course in my first year on a survey of Western literature, and our syllabus had not a single woman on it. So a group I know, I know Paula at a historically women's college, um, so a, it was a mixture of postgraduate and undergraduate students and some very wise and capable postgraduates got us together to try to combat this. Um, and each of us were assigned a period in quote unquote Western literature to research. And I was given the literary revival here in Ireland, um, which is one of the most prolific and important periods of literature um, of recent memory of cultural memory. Um, and I came across this author named Teresa Devi, who in a single night, her words changed my life. Uh, and that was six years ago. And I'm still out here stomping for our girl now. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. And how about you, Kate? Sure. So I had a, a little bit of a different path to Ireland and that I didn't actually have a, any specific uh, connection to Ireland. I had never been uh, before I picked up and, and blindly moved me and my dog across, <laughs> across the ocean in 2015. Um, but so I, I knew that I wanted to go to law school when I was in undergrad, um, but I both through the schools that I had spoken with and um, graduates who had gone before me um, had heard that it would be beneficial for a number of reasons to take some amount of time in between undergrad and law school. Um, and so I was looking for what that opportunity would look like. I, I didn't have a career that I specifically wanted to start other than being a lawyer and that required law school. So I, I couldn't do that yet. Um, and so I was looking at different master's programs and I had uh, had the opportunity to study abroad a little bit in undergrad and I loved that experience. And so when I heard about the Fulbright program, generally I was really interested in, in that opportunity, um, but I wasn't specifically originally looking at Ireland. And so actually I was going through all of the different opportunities um, that the, the full, various Fulbright commissions offer um, and, and looking at those. And in fact, I had written an entire Fulbright application to India um, at the first stage of my, my application process. Um, and one day toward, nearing the end of the application cycle, not through the Fulbright commission, but through my undergraduate institution, I had a little bit of a crisis realizing that I was not really equipped um, to do the, the research that I had proposed in, in this uh, application to do um, in India. And that I didn't really want to either. And so I um, went to my advisor and I had this moment. I was like, I know I'm supposed to want to do this. And she's like, no, there, there's no supposed to. What do you want to do instead? You know, so we went back to the list and um, I, when I was looking through the opportunities in Ireland, I found the DCU specific program um, and found their sexuality studies program, which is, uh, or was at least the first of its kind in Ireland and, and may still be, I'm, I'm not sure at this point. Um, and I was really intrigued by it. The program was brand new, I think maybe one or two years before I attended. Um, and that uh, was, was a really clear continuation of what I had worked on in undergrad. I was a philosophy major and a sexuality, women's and gender studies minor. Um, and, and so I saw a really clear path for continuing the work that I had done, but in an advanced de degree and uh, in a different context. And so I rewrote my whole application in, in about 24 hours and uh, worked out quite well. <laughs> Excellent. And, and did you then... So, okay, you said you, you came across that DCU master's. So you were looking around, you weren't quite sure what, what specifically you wanted to do, but you just went through it. Cause a lot of people maybe who are, who are watching this might not know specifically what they want to do yet. So they're having a look around and maybe it's overwhelming, you know, so any tips on that, on, on, on kind of narrowing it down? Sure. Um, I mean, just just be open to it. I mean, I, I knew that I wanted to, you know, stay relatively in my in my field. I was happy with what I had done in undergrad, but I, I wasn't sure exactly how to continue that. 
I mean, just go, it's, I mean, it sounds silly, but you know, you can just go on the various universities' websites and poke around in their programs. A lot of times they'll have links to their alumni um, or to work that their students have done in the past. And it'll give you a, a pretty good sense of that. That's something I'm interested in exploring. Or I remember seeing a, a number of titles of some of the courses that the sexuality studies program had offered in the past. And, you know, my first instinct was, I want the reading list for that course. Like, and sort of, if you have that, that sort of feeling about something, then maybe that's something to pursue. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point. And also, I suppose, comparatively, uh, the selection, like the choice in Ireland is, isn't as overwhelming as it would be in the US by any means. Um, <laughs> and what about you, Carmen? I know um, you, you changed your kind of path a little bit between your visit, your first visit to Ireland uh, and then coming back, but was it an easy choice for you, Royal College of Surgeons, or was it that you saw the opportunity as a sponsored award came up and you said, well, that's that's a really good fit? Um, I, I didn't know how good of a fit it would be until I, I reached out. Um, like Kate said, like I poked around on their website and I just um, I actually emailed a few different professors and supervisors and asked if they would meet with me. And, and that's what I did. I just um, sat down with people since I, I was still in Ireland during my internship. And that's when I decided mm -hmm. I should use this opportunity um, to, to actually meet people face to face. And I know not everyone has <laughs> the capability of doing that before they, they apply. Um, but essentially, I met a few different people and um, someone said, oh, hey, maybe, you know, you'd be interested in working with um, my current supervisor um, and that that's that's how we met and um, yeah it wasn't I don't I didn't it's kind of by chance that I just ended up in biomedical studies uh, I'm using a lot of the skills from my undergrad but uh, if you're applying for a Fulbright and the program isn't exactly what you've done before I think it's it's still all right to apply especially if you're really passionate about it mm -hmm. Yeah, so reaching out really is the doing a little bit of research, a bit of digging around, and then reaching out to the contacts that, that you see are available and having the conversations. And that's probably the biggest step in a way, because that's maybe the scariest part is putting, you know, dipping your toe in and then being brave and kind of reaching out as well. How about you, Esther? So was it always going to be Trinity for you or were there any other contenders? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. So I, and I think it's really helpful that you made this distinction in the presentation. I had applied to, I always knew that I wanted to do this project. So I had applied to a few funding schemes. Um, and as I was going through the motions of completing these applications, I was given the piece of advice from a professor at my undergraduate institution that you need to be hyper-specific with Fulbright where it's not just about you. It's equally, if not more about the project. So while for these other funding bodies, you're really trying to sell yourself, the Fulbright, want, the Fulbright Commission wants to know who you are, but more importantly, they want to know what you're going to accomplish and really importantly, what your project will accomplish in regard to um, international exchange, diplomatic exchange, mm. which was really helpful because I think some pressure is taken off when you're not just talking about yourself. Yeah, true. And, and that's the thing I suppose as well, it, when people are putting their proposal together, sometimes and, and maybe in certain subjects as well bringing in that kind of Fulbright ethos and the international exchange might be challenging at the start how do you think I mean how do you how do you think you brought that in to your application and was there anything any tips I suppose you'd give people on that yeah I mean for me specifically so I'm here on um, an open study slash research award and something that so I had an interview for my award and something that I really tried to center in that dialogue um, is the fact that while I'm the, the beneficiary and the recipient of this award, ultimately my time here is not about me. Um, my time really is, I meant to be a conduit for, um, in, in my humble opinion, a much greater and important voice who has been lost to the passage of time. And hopefully in doing this work here, it's a skill set that I'll develop that I'll be able to take home and do for our own authors, because there are many prolific and important women in our own literary history um, whose work has been erased. Mm -hmm. And that's an important distinction too, that sorry, it's just running in my mind from class today, that there's a difference between being forgotten and being erased. 
Yes, very much so. Yeah. No, it is really important work and, and definitely something, as you say, that you'll bring home then and you'll be able to, to do more and more and, and share with other people, you know, the skills to do that as well, I suppose, is the long term aim. Um, and in terms of getting your applications together, um, you know, Paula mentioned that there's Fulbright program advisors, but I know from conversations with you before that each of you had kind of different journeys with that and you had different people who mentored you and who helped you, uh, who guided you through um, the, the process in various different ways. So um, I think, Kate, you mentioned that you went through your Fulbright program advisor at your school, right? So maybe if you tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll hear from Carmen and SJ about their experiences. Sure. So um, as was, I also apologize if there's any clunking in the background. I've given my dogs frozen treats to keep them from barking, but you know, they, they still make some noise. Um, so uh, as was mentioned, I attended Rollins College, which is a, a small school down in Florida. Um, and until very recently, um, they had a, a phenomenal uh, external scholarship advisor, Dr. J. Uh, Jayashri Shivamogi, um, who worked with all undergraduate students um, to uh, look for and obtain various external scholarships, like, like um, the one through the, the Fulbright program. Um, and so, like I mentioned as well, Rollins had a very specific internal program as well. So we had to build our applications with uh, Dr. J's assistance um, and then get basically approval through the school before even submitting it to Fulbright. So if you're currently at an institution or, or thinking about going through that, you know, we, we can talk about um, you know, the, the Fulbright deadlines here, but there, it's possible that you'll have a different timeline if you're going through an institution. So keep an eye out for that as well. Um, so we had that process. Um, I, I don't know what the case is at, at my alma mater now. Dr. J has actually recently left to do her own consultancy thing, just to show you how excellent she, she was at her job there. Um, and yeah, so we had, you know, sort of internal interviews and, and different things to um, basically prep for, for the real application process. Um, which I found, uh, I mean, to be quite helpful, you know, in talking with different alumni who can sort of help you talk through and, and think through not just, you know, how, how are you going to get a Fulbright, but what does that really mean, both as, as we talked about for cultural exchange and, and for sort of the greater good in your work, but also what does that mean for your career path and your success after a Fulbright, the, right? The point of a Fulbright is that you return and you're bringing something back. So then what are you going to do with that? What is your next step? It's not just... You know, I'm going to go away for a year because it, it's fun, even though Ireland is quite fun, but <laughs> there, there's more to it as well. Um, so I'm happy to answer any more specific questions, but that's sort of an, an overview of what my process was like. Yeah, that's, that's really insightful. Great. And what about you, Carmen? So I would say, yeah, you've done the first thing, which is getting to hear from other Fulbright and alum. Um, that's what I did. Well, I, I knew that there was someone that had a Fulbright. He was actually a teacher and he actually went to go, um, I forgot where he went, but he went to go teach English. So it was a little bit different of an application, um, but I basically just asked him a bunch of questions and then I started on my application and I had a lot of help from writing tutors because the essays are a really big deal. Um, there's the statement of grand purpose and there's your personal statement. So those are those are really important and, and um, you want those to be of highest quality. So my, my biggest thing was um, getting help writing. And then I had a bunch of different teachers, even my supervisor at the Royal College of Surgeons, I had her read over um, my grant. She actually helped me even with my grant purpose. Um, just because I was coming from a different background. And I was like, oh, I don't really know all these um, biology words. <laughs> so I just got help from as many people as I could. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that really made a difference. Um, yeah, just don't, don't try to do your application alone, like sitting in your room, start to finish. It's, it's really, it's gonna drive you crazy. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. You need to have at least another eye on your on your work for anything really, right? For any application, you need at least somebody to proofread your work, never mind like having the conversations around it. And sometimes as well, I suppose your referees might might be those people for you. But it, very interesting to hear, Carmen, you know, that your your hosts, now that was through a sponsored award, but you know, if particularly for the research, uh, any research proposals, you know, the reaching out to your hosts early on or now you know as soon as possible um, and if they are eager to have you that's maybe something that they'd be interested in, in helping you out with so um good to know that that's a possibility at least um and that um, work for you i did forget to mention that i had a, a a fulbright advisor at my university but what happened was that i i wasn't really aware of this exact program that i applied to mm -hmm. um until the end of the summer so I actually didn't start my application until like August and, and I know that's really really late um and then my advisor at my university said you know our deadline is fast approaching and you're not going to make it so I was a little bit discouraged at first but then I thought okay there's also this October deadline and if I just you know utilize all the resources that I have especially those writing tutors <laughs> Mm -hmm. um i could i still finished my application on time even though it wasn't submitted with as um it's like a university affiliated mm -hmm. application okay excellent so plenty of time for people who are starting now and if you're watching this webinar in august <laughs> there's still time there's still a chance um you know if you put i mean i'm sure it was a lot of hard work, Carmen, getting it together in that short amount of time, but you did it. So yeah. uh, well done. <laughs> and how about you, SJ, in terms of um, mentors or, or support that you got um, putting your application together? Yeah, I think Carmen's absolutely correct that it's really something you can't do on your own. Um, and I was very fortunate to have a network of really incredible women who helped me with my application. And I think the Fulbright journey specifically started um, in my final year as an undergraduate. I was sent an email from our Associate Dean of Students about a Fulbright info session that um, I believe her name is Laura Siri, who works on the US side of Fulbright mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful, wonderful woman and an alum of my institution. Um, and she was offering an info session for students who had capstone projects and theses that would be um, appropriate for a research grant abroad. Um, so I attended that session. I was really excited by the prospect of the program. And then a year later, when the time was coming to apply, I ended up applying at large uh, just because I, you know, student activism is complex. And sometimes we work really hard to better our institutions by combating them. And I'd just been given the little tidbit to maybe apply at large, um, which was great because I still had help and resources from my professors. And then I was working as a grant writer for an arts and culture institution. Mm -hmm. So that definitely lended a skill set. Mm -hmm. um, I had a family friend who was a former Fulbright recipient who was also very, very helpful. Um, and my mentor back home in New York is um, a native Dubliner who's been in New York for the past few decades, a brilliant playwright and novelist named Honor Malloy. Um, and she was very helpful in the process. Um, I think her best bit of feedback was, um, don't talk about your interests, talk about what you've done. She's like, because odds are what you're interested in has already been actionable in your life. So don't say I'm interested in X, mm -hmm. Y, and Z. Talk about how you've already done that work, which yeah, was really helpful. Very true. Yeah. And that, I suppose as well, it's frozen for me a bit, but hopefully you can still hear me. My back. Um, sorry, but yeah, I think that's probably again something that's very true in all applications, you know. So, like the Fulbright application, it's really something that I think going through these processes you'll use again and again for job applications, research applications, whatever it is in the future, because you kind of these things uh, make sense, you know, once somebody brings it to your attention and, and you go through the process. Um, just somebody had a question, they had a glitch with their sound. Um, and they were asking, um, are most candidates postgrad masters candidates? So Paula had said that the majority of applicants that come to us are applying to master's courses, but it's possible to come to do research, to come and do a PhD. And we do have a number of sponsored awards um, in, in all of those areas. 
as well as the all discipline awards, which you know are open to whatever field you're in and whatever you want to do. Um, okay, so two of you are here at the moment. Uh, Kate has returned home, but I just wanted to touch on, I suppose, living in Ireland, cultural observations, you know, were there any surprises for you? Carmen, you'd been here before visiting, um, you know, you were already here, but I suppose even before that, maybe, do you know what I mean? Like your expectations of Ireland, um, you know, what were the surprises? And what are the things that, Kate, for you, that you missed the most and that you that, that SJ and Carmen, maybe you think you, you would miss when, when you return home? Okay. Kate, do you want to take that? Oh, sorry, Carmen, you go. Sorry. Um, I mean, if anyone else has anything that they want to just jump in, um, this is probably going to be voiced by the other panelists. And, and I think you actually said it before that uh, Ireland is really friendly and engaging. Um, you can't really not go come across a really friendly person on any walk. Anytime you go outside, you're probably going to run into someone that's just smiling or like even wants to start a conversation with you. Um, everyone is just really open and, and welcome. I mean, most people at least. And um, I haven't had any really negative experiences. <laughs> Uh, the only thing I would say is that it's a, it's a little bit pricey, so you're going to need that Fulbright award <laughs> to pay for or some of the the housing, especially um, tips on housing. I guess like Facebook has a lot of groups. If you are looking for accommodation, subleases, um, there's tons of student dorms that you can live in, and they have gyms. They have uh, study rooms they have basically all the amenities that you could need gyms yeah everything um so I did stay in student accommodation for a little while because I wanted to spend time looking for a place before and I'm, I'm lucky enough to be here for four years so I know it might be a little bit more of a time crunch for other people um but I would suggest spending enough time looking at different neighborhoods, looking at different apartment buildings, um, because everyone kind of has what they like the most. Like I, I like staying further out from city center just because there's more space, there's more greenery. And don't get me wrong. I mean, Dublin has parks everywhere, but um, I like living more on the east side just because there's the beach and stuff like that. Um, yeah, if you could maybe stay at a hotel or something like that before you actually um, end up signing a lease. Yep. Excellent. And then also, I suppose, like hearing from, from, from all of you about this, but also getting in touch with, you know, other alum too, you know, who've gone to maybe, you know, if you want to go to Cork, if you want to go to Galway, you know, our alum are always really happy to be in touch with you to talk about you know, like your preferences, like Carmen was saying, if you want to be by the beach, if you want to be, you know, closer to town, if you want to be in a busy area, quiet area, all of that, like, you know, you can talk to people who've been on the ground, who are on the ground now, um, to give you their kind of practical advice on that. And how about and I just have one more thing, like join a club or some kind of activity or a sport, because you can form a community around yourself a little bit faster and you might not feel so isolated like no so new um mm -hmm. it's just kind of a good way to assimilate in with the rest of your community yeah that's a really good tip really good tip when you land on the ground and if you don't know one, so you're automatically yeah. in, a, in a sports or a community kind of group is um, a great way to make friends mm -hmm. um and how about you kate um what from from was it 2013 you're here what are, the things, yeah. <laughs> what are the things you 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 miss most or um I know you just visited it again recently so <laughs> yeah, I did I was very lucky to be back um it just sounds so cliche but it's really true that everyone is just so friendly I mean I tend to not like people very much and so if you had told me before I moved to Ireland that 
I was going to live someplace where, you know, people would just come anytime I, you know, was out for the night or for a coffee that I would meet somebody new. And I would have told you that sounds terrible. They like, leave me alone. I don't tend to, to like new, meet new people, but everyone I met, I loved. <laughs> like it was a really just a whole sort of different experience. Um, so it, if any of you are introverted or, or otherwise uh, not super pro human like, like I am sometimes uh, don't don't let that that part scare you off um other things I missed I mean the the history is just amazing I mean we have you know obviously a much shorter history in in the U.S. for uh for one thing at least in terms of um the dominant culture uh and so you know just just being somewhere where there is such a wealth of history and, and also really excellent museums and memorials and different exhibitions about that history was phenomenal. I mean, I like learned so much um, about Ireland, not from any formal education, you know, a good mix of, of touristy type things, but also really, really well done um, exhibits and, and museums are, are just everywhere. I lived in in the city center, um, so you know there was um, those were particularly immediate around me. Um, there are, in fact, as as mentioned, a, a bunch of parks in in Dublin city center that you know I spent a lot of time in, and it's a, a good mix of, you know, you get a little bit of that city and, and bustle feel, but it's not overwhelming the same the way that um, some larger cities are in the U.S. Um, other unique, so I, I'm vegan and there there are some like foods that I found in Ireland that haven't come to the US as there are vice versa. So there, there's some vegan cheeses over there that I really missed too, <laughs> perhaps a bit too specific. Um, I, I also wanted to mention on the, the housing front, I echo the advice to, to try and find somewhere to stay temporarily. So I booked an Airbnb, I think for the first two weeks that I was there um, while I was looking for housing, um, which was, uh, tremendously helpful. I couldn't imagine trying to find a place and sign a lease before before hopping over there. And so that's certainly doable and I recommend that. Um, it was a little bit more difficult since, as I mentioned, I brought my dog. So I'm not sure I would particularly advise that unless unless you're up for the challenge. Um, but my my dog, I only had one at the time, certainly wasn't going to get left behind. So that was, that was non-negotiable for me. Um, and I was going to mention something else. Oh, just uh, in terms of people being willing to, to help out in, in different ways, the way that I actually found my apartment that I, I wound up staying in uh, for the rest of the time that I was in Dublin um, was that I had gone on a, a first date that actually we didn't click at all, but it was perfectly lovely. And uh, this person wound up um, knowing somebody else who was moving out of their flat and knew that it was available and dog friendly, so, so recommended it on to me. So uh, didn't didn't turn into a relationship, but did did get a flat out of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Worthwhile, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and that's the thing, I suppose. As well, like in Ireland, we always laugh because you probably we there's so many connections in terms of, you know you know people through people, and there's you know everyone can put each other in touch and all that because it's such a small island and equally then if you're in the city center i mean within half an hour three quarters of an hour you're in in the countryside you know you're in open air and in, in like fields everywhere and everything no matter which city you're in so it's a nice balance of that i think as well um how about you sj and actually have, have you had a chance to travel as well like around the country any of you would you take that sj sure um, yeah, I'm just going to echo the sentiments of Carmen and Kate that everyone is really friendly. Um, I had a very emotional and kind of kismet encounter the day I landed, which Paula, I don't think I actually told you this story, but the day that I landed in Dublin, um, I'm at Trinity, which I don't think I mentioned, and Trinity's great because they set up transport for incoming students to wherever they're staying, um, and I'm staying in the North City Centre, um, and it was this kind of weird sequence of events where they couldn't put me in a cab so they're like there's a shuttle it'll take you to a spot close to your accommodation it comes in five hours just sit here and wait and I was like oh, okay I'll, I'll read in the airport and listen to Ariana Grande play on a loop for two hours which was great 2013 Ariana Grande I will say um, <laughs> but the bus ended up taking me to the uh, Rotunda Maternity Hospital which is right next to where I live which I didn't know uh, which is very funny that I didn't know because I'd mentioned my my mentor, Honor, who's a writer from Dublin. 
And for about four years before coming here, I'd been working with her on developing a historical piece about the rotunda. And it's a space that's lived in my brain for four years um, as like a daily thought. So to get step out of a bus <laughs> and to see this huge building that I've looked at nearly every day, I began to cry because I'm a bit emotional. <laughs> and two of the nurses who were outside smoking a cigarette, which is an image again, that's been painted in my head so often, were like, are you okay, dear? <laughs> And I was like, I am. And they're like, what's wrong? And I was like, I just flew here from the United States and this is my relationship to this building. And we had a beautiful conversation about the history of the building, their work there, um, where it, it ended up being another hour until I, I walked into my building. <laughs> Making friends straight off the bus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, and in regard to travel, yeah, I... Um, actually was able to head up north my first week here because a dear friend from back home who's originally from Derry was able to coordinate my arrival um, to be able to go up and see I think we kind of met in the middle geographically um, in Donegal which has been yeah. nice yeah lovely lovely great scenery in Donegal mm -hmm. um okay well we only have a few more minutes left I'm sad I want to talk to you all day um but Maybe we could talk a little bit about impact so far. So Kate, obviously there's been a bit of distance since you've been in Ireland. So you might be able to measure that better. SJ and Carmen, you know, you're, you're obviously still here, but I'm sure there's been impacts already in terms of, you know, your, your work and um, where, your path and where, where you're going afterwards. Um, so who would like to take that one first? Just, and any other comments as well, you wanna, you know, any tips and things that you would like to give to potential applicants? You could tie in there. <laughs> yeah, I, I can start since, as, as you mentioned, I've probably had the most uh, distance uh, between my Fulbright um, and now. It, it's funny because I so I, I came to law school the, the fall after I, I left Ireland um, and pretty quickly changed um, my area of focus. So I obviously I was working in uh, philosophy and women's studies and uh, particularly with a focus on working with survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault previously. And that's what I, I thought I would wind up in law school to do. Um, and is not, I know I now work in animal law and policy. Um, so in that sense, my direct academic work hasn't um, followed me as much as it, it might for others or, or if I had, had stuck in that path. Um, but at the same time, I, I still have tons of connections to, to my time in Ireland. I mean, you know, I, I can talk for hours or, or days to anybody about the connections between feminist studies and animal studies. So we, we can leave that for another day, but um, it, the, the work certainly has connections there. Um, but uh, I mean, the, the experiences I had in the academic institution in terms of working with people from all different um, fields and different locations has been incredibly helpful through my time as a student and, and now as a practicing attorney. Certainly, um, I've met somebody else who, who works in my field who's actually from Ireland. And so it's a fun little connection that, that we have and, and get to share and chat about. Um, and I, I think it's been really um, sort of a, a boost to my career as well. You know, people see Fulbright and they know that that really means something. And that that has certainly served me and uh, as hopefully animals and others that I advocate for as a sort of assistance to, to get my foot in the door with, with folks and, and working um, on what I do. So one other tip, totally unrelated, uh, Carmen mentioned joining a sports team or, or other club to find a community. Um, I could not play a sport to save my life, but I did, did wind up getting a, a separate job when I was in Dublin, which is something um, that you can do. I mean, the the stipend um, can absolutely cover your expenses, but I wanted some extra money to be able to, to travel a bit more and do more. And, you know, I worked about 10 hours a week in a, in a shop um, close to my apartment and found a great group of women there that I worked with and, and stayed in touch with. And that actually gave me a, a sense of community. So that's an option too. If, if you find you have too much time on your hands, which would be surprising. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kate. And how about um, Carmen, is it, is it too early to measure any impacts? I mean, but even in terms of just the people you've met so far and things like that. 
Um, I, I don't think it's too early. I, I definitely feel like Dublin has had an impact on me. Um, it's such an international city. Um, I mean, even Cork and some of the other big cities in, in Ireland are very international. You're always going to see people from all over the place or hear all kinds of languages walking down the street. And um, it's very connected. I mean, I know it's an island, but it, it's also pretty connected in, in some political ways. And I actually have not exactly shifted my career goals, but um, instead of just doing research for the rest of my career, I actually want to go into more of science diplomacy and science policy. And um, I'm lucky enough to be going to Bonn, Germany for a placement. Um, so I'm doing some research there for three months. Um, mm -hmm. And the UN headquarters, the um, one of the headquarters, I believe, is in UN. Uh, sorry, is in Bonn. And um, so I'm going to kind of do a tour. And I, I haven't done it yet, so I'm not really sure what impact it'll have. But I've definitely gotten um, more exposure to like science policy and and diplomacy. And um, it's I, I wasn't really expecting that from my my stay in Dublin. That's amazing. It sounds like a fantastic opportunity to go to Bonn. And I suppose as well, Europe, like every, all, like so many cities in Europe are so close, um, just a short flight away. So it's really um, kind of doable to just go on weekend trips or, or more formal trips like you're describing as well. Um, and how about you, SJ? Yeah, I feel like I've seen um, an immediate impact. I mean, on the you know, in regard to like developing one's professional career and life. Um, I It was mentioned in my bio, I've had the opportunity to speak at one academic conference already, and I'll be speaking at two more international conferences here in Ireland in June and July, which is really great for um, larger scale advocacy of DV, but separate from the macro on the micro level, just living here, getting to talk with Irish people every day about this extraordinary woman who most of them had never heard of, um, it's been a really amazing experience. Um, I've exchanged emails and numbers with so many people at coffee shops and pubs. And one woman even sent me an email after which was very sweet because she'd gone on, looked into DB's work and said, I can't believe they made me read Yates in school and they were hiding this woman from us. Um, and to see that happen um, in her, her country has been incredible. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, okay, well, unfortunately we've run out of time. But I think everyone who's attending will agree that it's been amazing to hear your stories. Um, all of you are doing very different things in terms of study and research. But I think all of you, safe to say, you had a really good experience in Ireland and you're making and have made lasting connections here through the Fulbright program. So I'm sure it's very, very encouraging for applicants watching um, live today and also watching on uh, our YouTube channel. So um, I'd like to thank you, SJ, Carmen, and Kate, so much for giving your time today and for joining us. Uh, Paula, of course, for presenting um, the overview of the awards. Um, for any applicants, as Paula mentioned, you can find out more about Irish awards, awards to Ireland on fulbright.ie, and then about the US awards process, fulbrightonline.org, so through the US Fulbright Student Programme. Um, and there are lots of webinars there as well with further detail guiding you through the application. Um, and uh, I, I would strongly encourage you to check out those resources. Um, but if you do want to reach out to us, awards at fulbright.ie, you can contact Paula or any of our team um, if you have any direct questions. So uh, I will leave you all go to enjoy your day, but thank you again so much to our panelists and presenters to, for joining us today and to everyone who uh, joined us to listen in and hopefully we'll see lots more of you. Thanks a million. See you guys. Thanks again. Thanks everybody.